And there is a Scandinavian connection because um, if, you, if you go on Wikipedia, it actually says that the, the brainchild of Ronan O'Reilly uh, came from him hearing some Scandinavian and Dutch pirate radio stations. And actually the first ship was uh, a Danish passenger ferry that was converted. But we think that was Caroline North, don't we? Yes, we do, yeah. 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 Um, tell us, before you started on Radio Caroline, yeah. you were actually a singer, weren't you? Um, yes, I was. I, I don't know if probably nobody's been to Bournemouth. It's my hometown in, um, in England. I was a singer and a dance and a guitarist with a big dance band. And uh, then they advertised for disc jockeys for Radio Caroline. And um, I answered an advert in the New Musical Express. It's one of the big music papers we had over there. Um, did an audition and uh, just got the job and been talking nonsense ever since. <laughs> really? <laughs> that was a long time ago. And, uh, and these, these little ships, I, I remember the first time I um, uh, saw it. We, we used to go from a little, a little trawler boat that took us out three and a half miles off the coast of Frinton, which is in the southeast uh, part of England. And the idea was that um, we would go out there because three miles outside, is t we were in territorial waters and we flew the Panamanian flag. So there was nothing the British government could do about it because if they went on board, they were in effect uh, declaring war on Panama. And uh, so the idea was that we went through customs, we were meant to be going to Holland, but for three years I never got there. <laughs> and uh, we used to just stay there and we did two weeks on the ship and a week off and uh, we just went out there and played pop music. Now we just mentioned that Radio 2 currently has 15.5 million yes. listeners, yes. but Radio Caroline had even more in those days. I think they probably did, yes. I mean, um, we immediately, as soon as we, because the BBC wasn't playing any popular music at the time, it was a mixture of things. I think we had three quarters of an hour of pop music during the day. Uh, uh, but whereas the pirate ships came on and um, started playing music 24 hours, well, more or less 24 hours a day. And then eventually the Radio Caroline was joined by an American ship called Big L Radio London. And I, I went and joined that one because it was a much more professional outfit. And it bought all the top 40 radio that we have now into this country. It was, it was run by the Americans and they really just knew how to do it a little bit better. So Radio Caroline was the one that everybody remember, but the one that I model all my, everything I've done since on is the Big L, Radio London. Because the, the guy we saw in that clip was Simon D, who was the first voice. Yes, he was the first voice. Yeah. That, he was the very first voice on Radio Caroline. Mm. Um, sadly, he, he passed away about two years ago, I think it was. But he actually, he didn't sound very good. No, it wasn't. It was, I mean, it was very old. F now it sounds very old-fashioned. Yeah. And uh, it was like that, it was very slow, but, but it was the fact that we got all the kids listening in. And of course, he, he was pretty young. I mean, I was only 21 when I first went out there. And all the DJs, all the broadcasters on the BBC were well over, you know, 40. And so they, they, they didn't really relate to the, to the, to the youngsters. Should we, I, I think Tony's playing it down because he was a lot better than Simon D. Should we, should we have a listen to how Tony yeah. was? <laughs> on Radio Caroline? <laughs> Here we go. So that was a new release. Yeah. <laughs> so I, th I think Tony yeah. was a lot better than Simon D, wasn't mm. he? Yeah, I think I was actually. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it was interesting because there you heard it was a rough sea. We used to have ten force gales, and in fact, in that little ship there, we were eventually we were shipwrecked and uh, we were taken off by uh, lifeguards and everything. But we used to the the public loved hearing uh, us going through it, and and. 
this particular boat as well. It used to rock from side to side like mad, but nobody heard what we were going through, so we used to throw things uh, from one side of the room to the other just to make it sound even worse than it really was. Just to, just to get the atmosphere, but it was, a, it was a very exciting time. And we did go out there, although we're called pirates, we, the idea of going out there was to bring about commercial radio in Great Britain. That was, that was the serious side to it. And it took quite a long time, you know, I mean, I was out there for three years, and Radio Caroline continued after, um, you know, they, they tried to ban it. And you didn't actually join in March of 1964, did you? you no. You, you no. joined at what date did um, you join? July. Yeah. Yeah, about July the 25th, I think it was. Yeah. And, and who were the other DJs on, on air then? Um, well, there's one which we can mention over here, Dave Lee Travers. Yeah. Was on. <laughs> um, he was here. Um, there, were, there were others that um, later on, a, a terrific guy called Kenny Everett, yeah. not on Radio Caroline, on Big L Radio London, Dave Cash. Um, a lot of the people that eventually ended up going uh, and to Radio uh, Radio 1. And how did you get the job? Did you have to do an audition? Um, well, for the Radio Caroline one, yes. Yeah, I did. I, d I did the audition. I went to Caroline House. Um, I introduced about five records, and um, the program controller, he said, you know, come back in about half an hour or so, which I did. And he said, uh, you know, when can you go out there? So I think about a couple of days later, I, uh, I joined Radio Caroline, and that was it and had a fabulous time. I mean, it was great fun. I mean, it was really good fun out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, what we were doing was quite revolutionary, you know, because I think all of us knew that we, would have, we were altering the whole of broadcasting in Great Britain. And the BBC knew it as well. You know, they knew the game was up, but, uh, the but they, they hung on in there. And, of course, now we're, we're all there with the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how long were you on Radio Caroline? Uh, I was on Radio Caroline for two years. Right. And then I joined uh, another ship um, came practically alongside us, which was a much bigger ship than this one, uh, a big American minesweeper. And it was much more powerful. And, um, and it had all these wonderful American jingles, wonderful, uh, which eventually B the BBC copied. Mm -hmm. And we had the same jingle set. They were all American. And the, they bought in rotating the same 40 or 50 records. And that's what, you know, that's what modern day broadcasting is, is based on, really, a lot of it. So, Tony now on the Big mm. L. Yeah, the Big L. Um, which was re really where you really felt at all. This one, yeah, yes. It was the jingles that you really loved, oh, I loved them, it? yes. Yeah, I mean, the jingles were fantastic. I mean, they put a, a stamp on the sound of the station. I don't think... And I, I do a programme on uh, the BBC now called Pick of the Pops, and I introduced these jingles back into it. And over the last year, I don't know, it's just because of the jingles, we put on over a million to yeah, the audience. It's definitely the jingles. I think it's the jingles, yeah. I don't, I don't think it's you, Tony. <laughs> it's not me, no. <laughs> but the jingles are absolutely marvellous, and they, and they give it a happy sound, and uh, I, ju I just absolutely adore them. I got them at home, I've got a whole lot at home, and I quite often, as sad as I, sad as I am, I play them to myself quite often. <laughs> <laughs> just imagine I'm about, about out there again. Now, yeah. part, part of your <laughs> act in those days was telling corny jokes, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, when, yeah. When did that start? Um, well, I started that actually right from the word go. Um, telling, telling jokes and things like that, and um, right from the, you know, when I first started, went on the air. Yeah. And then I went to uh, Radio London, and they tried to stop me telling them. 
<laughs> and um, but I thought it was I thought it was quite funny, you know. But uh, but I don't I don't tell them as much now as I used to because I think you've got to alter the. No, you can't resist years. sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. though, sometimes. I but texted you the other week yeah. when you were d you did one on ra on uh, Radio Two. Oh yes, and yeah. it made me chuckle. <laughs> but they, they were bad jokes. Oh, dreadful, yeah. But uh, but you know I, I've always tried to gear it around trying to make people laugh a little bit, and that and uh, so that's that's my style really. You also had a dog. Yeah, I had an imaginary dog called Arnold, <laughs> who um, who now would be if he was still alive would be fifty years old. Uh, but he, I got him on a, off a sound effect record, and people really believed it was a real dog. <laughs> and I killed the dog off because eventually he was getting more fan mail than I was. <laughs> so. Uh, but uh, but I tell the, uh, and I tell people now, you know, people still amazingly they, they know this dog Arnold, and um, I say now that I've uh, he passed away, but I've had him stuffed, and he nods in the back of the car. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but the dog was amazingly popular. Yeah, we mentioned Kenny Everett, yes. who was on uh, Radio London with yeah. you, the yeah. Big L, and um, we've got a little clip here of Tony making a mess of the news and the oh, weather. Yeah. And just about everything. Well, I'll explain what actually happened. Yeah. Um, we used to have the, the weather. We used to put blips in between each uh, news item. And we used to read the news as well. We used to take time in reading the news. Uh, Kenny Everett, he... I think I'm right in saying he, he unplugged my headphones. And I had to read the news, but I didn't realise what was going on. Right. So I just ploughed through it. <laughs> <laughs> and as you'll hear. Yeah. Let's have a listen. It was one day when he first joined the boats when he didn't quite know how to work oh, his equipment. That, yeah. And we had three cartridge machines in front of us uh, with jingles on. One of them had a blip on it for in-between newscasts. You know, you go like, Vietnam, like that. Right. That was one of them. The other one was, here's the latest weather word on wonderful Radio London. And the last one was, boom, ya -da -da -da, for the end of the news. Well, his headphones weren't working that day. <laughs> he probably hadn't noticed. And he didn't know which one to press. So he pressed the wrong one, a lot, and kept talking over it. And here is the recording. Grotesque quality, but it's all there. And the deadline is Tuesday, April the 11th, Westminster. Carry on regardless. Not, the, not my best moment. No. <laughs> <laughs> and from there, the government in the UK got rather agitated about uh, Radio Caroline, mm. Radio London. There were pirates popping up all over. There was Radio yep. England, Radio Scotland, yep. uh, Radio Caroline North. Um, uh, so they passed a law to mm. ban pirate radio from the UK. In yeah. 1966? I think it was 66, yes, yeah. that's right. It was the Marine Offences Bill, which made it illegal to advertise on the pirate ships, and they also couldn't bring food out or fuel or anything like that, which meant we had to get it from Holland. And it, they also made it illegal to broadcast on there as well. Yeah. So that meant you all had to come onto dry land. Well, a lot, yeah, a lot of us did. You know, we yeah. thought we'd, it was time you know, to, to pack it in. Radio Caroline continued. Radio London, um, they closed down. And the BBC, did they approach you or did you approach um, them? They, they actually approached... Um, well, I had a, um, a manager called Harold Davison. I met a, a guy called Harold Davison who 
was the manager to Frank Sinatra and Ella Fitzgerald and all the big singers. And he called me into his office and, and he said, um, he was an agent, and he said to me, he said, uh, I've listened to you out on the pirate ships. And he said, if you would like to come to my agency, I'll make you the top disc jockey in three months. So I thought it sounded quite a good idea, really. <laughs> so um, I joined him, and he did it actually in two months. Yeah? And he got me the... Uh, yeah, he said that there's a, a station going to open up with the BBC called uh, Radio One, uh, because the, the Labour Party in, in the country got in, and they wouldn't bring about commercial radio. So um, BBC were forced into opening up a, a pop station, and um, he got me the job as the first voice on there. So I, in effect, opened up Radio One. <laughs> And, uh, I mean, that was a, an amazing thing to happen, you know. Uh, I mean, I remember our first audience ratings on The Breakfast Show. We had 21 million amazing. listening. I mean, the whole, practically the whole country was listening in. Yeah. yeah. Let's see the opening. Now, with the clock ticking slowly up to 7 a.m., it's going to be time to welcome Radio One's first daily show on 247 metres medium wave, whilst Breakfast Special continues on Radio Two. Ten seconds to go before Radio One, Tony Blackburn, and Radio 2, Paul Hollingdale, stand by for switching, get tuned to Radio 1 or 2, 5, 4, 3, Radio 2, Radio 1, go. The voice of Radio 1, <coughs> just for fun, music, too much. And good morning everyone, welcome to the exciting new sound of Radio 1. Dog. Yeah. <laughs> Arnold. Well, Arnold. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes, Lee, we've even got Arnold back. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first of the Tony Blackburn Church. I should be waking up every morning except Sunday between 7 and 8.30. So let's away! And the first record was? Uh, Flowers in the Rain by The Move. And was that meant to be the first record? Um, yes, I mean, well, I, I chose it because it had that lovely crashing sound at the beginning of it, yeah. and I thought it was a good start to a, a station. Yeah. And then in those days, that, you know, the woofing sound and, and thing, we used to have our own theme tunes in those days, which, of course, we don't, don't have now. And, uh, of course, you heard the first jingle there, which was, of course, rather like Big L Radio London, mm -hmm. because the BBC went to America, they went to Pam's Jingles, and uh, said, we love these jingles, can you make us some? So it sounded really similar. You, you actually did join the BBC before Radio 1 launched. Yes, I, I, joined, um, I joined the, it was called the Light Programme, and um, I was the youngest DJ they had there, and, and I remember when I went in there first, we, they said, can we have a script? Uh, and of course I ad-libbed the whole time, and so we didn't, I didn't have a script, and it was really dear old BBC, and um, the producer said, well, okay, you don't have a script, you, you, you know, fine, ad-libbing, but could you come in a half an hour before the show? Because otherwise I'm going to have to cancel the, uh, the coffee and donuts. <laughs> and, but the, the BBC was, uh, they were really welcoming to us, very welcoming to us. Yeah, was, was, was there really a woman in the corner who was knitting? Oh, there was, yeah. On the first programme, we, we always used to joke about the BBC being a bit old-fashioned and uh, you know, not really quite up to date, unlike it is now. And I remember saying to, I think it was Kenny Everett out on the ships, I said, if we ever go to the BBC, I'm sure there'd be a dear old woman there sitting knitting a jumper. <laughs> and I, on my first program, there was a dear old woman there. <laughs> and she managed to finish a whole sleeve off <laughs> during one of my programs. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, and we didn't put our own records on in those days either. You know, no? We, no, we didn't do that. Uh, Radio One, that was the first time ever that somebody, you know, we were controlling our own records and, and uh, they designed, they got Kenny and I in there, the BBC, and said, what do you want in the studio? And they built us a studio yeah. so that we could do it the way we did on the pirate ships. So they were very good. Instead of um, saying, look, this is the way we do it, they said, we want to learn the way you do it. And so it was a really good partnership. Should we uh, play a jingle? Lovely. You, you like jingles? I love jingles, yeah. yeah here we go. <laughs> That's a lovely yeah. jingle. I love that jingle, yeah. yeah. What, what I did actually, when the um, Radio London, what, the power of Big L Radio London, 
Uh, I realized then that, um, you know, the power of jingles and uh, the fact that you can, in a strange sort of way, brainwash people into, into a particular brand name. So what I did, I was the first DJ in the country to go out and actually commission a set of jingles with my own name on it. Right. And so it had, I used to have the Tony Blackburn show, and I was amazed that the BBC allowed me to do that. And, um, and when there was a poll on or anything like that, I had another little jingle that went, the Tony Blackburn show, he's number one, 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 one. Right. And, <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> and it, uh, it used to, so I, I've always realized the power of jingles. And I don't think people even now in modern radio in, in, in Great Britain realize how, how important they are. Yeah. Well, they come and go in, yes, in and out of vogue, don't they? Yeah, they, they do, yeah. And I think they're actually coming back in again at the moment. I think they are, yeah. 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 And, I and, love them, though. And that, that was one of the best. What, the summer what, one, yes. What show were you on then? Um, do you know, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, yeah. I think it must have been Radio 1. Yeah. It was probably Radio 1. Yeah, no, but... but oh, uh, this one here. Yeah, probably oh, the mid-morning show then. That was a mid-morning show, yeah. I think, yeah. Because you kind of moved right through the schedule, didn't you? Yes. Um, you, you sort of start off on the breakfast show, and then, unfortunately, five years later, a, a very talented bloke called Noel Edmonds appeared on the scene, who was younger and better looking than me. <laughs> and um, so he got, he, and I just got married, and he got, the, he got that job. So I was then moved on to uh, mid-mornings, and then I was in the afternoon. And then I knew that my time was up because I was moved on to the weekends <laughs> and uh, playing Puff the Magic Dragon and uh, <laughs> all the kid stuff. And I thought, but at the same time, I was doing a, um, another show down the road at Radio London, um, BBC Radio London, where I was doing, I was suddenly became a, um, I don't know, a, a, a shock jock mm. for a time, yeah. yeah. I really enjoyed that. Well, before we get to that, because you did the chart show as well. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the the phrase, well, not even the phrase, but the word "sensational" became yeah. synonymous with you for yeah, a certain did. period of time, didn't it? Well, I didn't realise I was saying it a lot, but uh, it yeah. was pointed out to me I was. So then I sort of introduced it a little bit. Yeah. Well, I tried to find a clip of you saying "sensational." Sensational. Yeah, and <laughs> I, I got this is the closest I got to yeah. it. You didn't yeah. actually say sensation. Sensation. <laughs> From his home. Pips. Yeah, the pips. Yeah. And uh, if you listen to that, you would think you were, you were absolutely overjoyed to be doing Junior Choice. Yeah. But the reality is you absolutely hated it. Yeah, I hated it, yeah. I, d I don't like entertaining children. <laughs> I mean, I love children, don't get me wrong. I've got two of my own, and they're lovely. But uh, it wasn't for me, into, you know, playing that sort of music. Uh, because I, this is the sort of music I like, soul music. And I was, I've always loved that. And when I went to the BBC, I introduced a lot of... Um, uh, black soul music to the Motown and Philadelphia music and stuff like that. Yeah. And then to go on a, a kid show uh, playing, you know, some of the Sparky and the Talking Train and some of these things, although they, you know, very good, but it wasn't for me, no. So during that period while you were on weekends, yeah. you went to the new Radio London, which was BBC Radio yeah. London then, mm. because the pirates had all gone. Yeah. And you're doing a kid show on a Saturday morning. Yes. And then during the week, you're doing a mid-morning show on Radio London, yeah. playing soul and talking about sex. Yes. Yeah, it was, <laughs> I enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I was doing an awful show in the, in the afternoon, actually, when I first went there, and um, I'll tell you the story about how I got that job. Yeah, go on. Uh, um, it was a guy called Derek Amor, who was the controller of Radio London, BBC, and he was a bit of a rebel, and uh, he drank quite a bit as well. And um, I, he wanted me to do a show uh, called the BBC Blackburn Barnes and Corporation. And, and it was a very nice, she was a very nice lady, but I didn't really want to do the show with her. And so um, I said to him, we went out to dinner one night, and I said to him, um, I'd really rather not do a show like that because it sounds awful. 
And I did one thing I'd never done in my life before, and I have never done, I will never do again. I resigned. And I said, I can't do that show. So he said, um, what, you resign? And they said, yeah. And we were having, uh, we'd had a couple of glasses of wine. He said, oh, please don't resign. So I said, all right, then I'll come back. And he said, well, you haven't resigned? I said, no. So he said, well, all right, I'll sack you. And so I said, well, you can't do that because I just resigned. <laughs> and so um, I said, oh, don't, don't sack me. That's really unfair. So he said, all right, then. So I said, I'm not sacked. He said, no. So I said, all right, I'm going to resign. <laughs> and um, it went on like this, and we had more and more to drink. And um, by the end of the evening, he said to me, he said, I can't remember if I've sacked you or you've resigned. <laughs> so he said, what the hell do you want to do? So I said, well, I want to go on the radio and play fabulous soul music and basically uh, talk about soul music is very sexual and it's sensual music, and I want to be quite outrageous on the air. And he said, it sounds like a terrific idea. <laughs> and um, so I did it. And the, on the first program, I thought I was really way over the top. And um, he, he came and he said, I thought you were going to be rude and thing. I said, well, I thought I was. And, you know, I was pushing the barriers. And he said, I want you to go further than that. And so uh, and eventually I did. And I, I got quite nervy about it. You know, I thought, I can't go any further. And we were... To, and, and then I introduced a thing called the Soul Night Out, where we made a lot of money on the thing. It was difficult for the BBC. So we put it into... I Eventually, when I left there, it, we had men's posing pouches with Radio London written on them, <laughs> and women's stockings and suspenders. And I used to talk about this on air a lot. And the person that was um, employing me to do the children's show on Radio 1, uh, he phoned up uh, Derek Amor and said, can you stop Tony Blackburn talking about stocking suspenders and men's posing pouches and sex on the radio? And he said, well, we're not worried about him talking about it. We're trying to stop him wearing them. <laughs> so, and the head of Radio 1 put the phone down and that was me gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that marked so that the it. end of Radio 1. I think so, yes. Yeah. I think so. But yeah. I was quite happy about it. I was, I was too old for the station, I yeah. think. And I'd been there too long. Yeah. So I, I, I went to uh, Radio London. I had a, 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 the best time of my life there. And it was, a, it was a great show. Soul music has always been my passion. Over the years, I've been privileged to work with some of the greatest soul singers of all time. This is the album I've always wanted to release. Tony Blackburn presents Soul Classics, out Monday. And you're still playing soul music on the radio now? Oh, yes, I do. Um, I work for, in, in Britain, I work for six, six radio stations. Um, on on f Sundays, I'm on five all at the same time. Uh, I do three, uh, I do a soul programme for uh, a station just outside London, which is recorded. Uh, I do a 60s and 70s show for a station in Berkshire. This is on Sunday. And then I have an hour's break and I do a three-hour soul show. Then I have a an hour's break and I go down and do three hours on a commercial radio station. Um, so I, yeah, I work, I'm doing a lot. And, and then of course Radio 2, which is now the biggest radio station in Great Britain, I do a, um, a thing called Pick of the Pops, which is one of those historic shows, isn't it, John? It's yeah. gone on for years, hasn't it? Yeah, um, original, well, I think originally was it probably David Jacobs or um, someone like that? Yes, one of those, yes, yeah. I think so, one of them. Yeah. But the, the, the guy who was syn synonymous was, was a friend of both Alan of ours called a Alan Fluff Freeman. Yes, yes. Uh, who was just an exceptional Fabulous, yeah. jock. Fabulous. Uh, and um, then we won't talk about the guy who took af after him, but you know, <laughs> because you, you really were the one who should have inherited it, and you, well, you finally you. have. Mm. And... Um, and here's Tony showing us around the Pick of the Pop studio. Hi, everyone. Well, this is the view from uh, BBC like Radio 2, as you can see. <laughs> Bit of an overcast day out there. Uh, hasn't been raining, that's the main thing. This is the BBC Radio 2 studio. And at 1 o'clock, this is where I will be doing uh, my Pick of the Pops from. So uh, I hope you can join me at 1 o'clock this afternoon. Well, I've got two great years for you, 1971 and 1982 this week. And they really are tremendous years, which I think you're going to enjoy. So I hope you'll be able to join me at 1 o'clock <coughs> live. Now, if you can't, I know a lot of you go out shopping and things like that. It is available on Catch Up just after we finish the show. So uh, just after Graham Norton, he's on at the moment, finishes his show, I'll be on with you at 1 o'clock. Pick of the Pops, BBC Radio 2, 1971 and 1982. Hope you can join me. Did you just do that on your iPhone? Uh, yes, I did, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I did it on the iPhone, yeah. 
I mean, you, I've always you, embraced technology. I love technology. I was As you say, know, you, I'm you're, downloading you're, something at the moment. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're big on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you do little video casts yes. as well. Yeah. In, in fact, when you, Tony worked for me at Smooth Radio for a while, That's and, right. and yeah. you, you were doing some sort of video casts during the show. Yeah, which um, I didn't tell anybody I was doing. Yeah. And uh, I, think, I think it was you that rang up and said, oh, I enjoy doing that. Yeah. You know, it's that. But uh, I was stopped doing it by the engineers. Yeah, the engineers were happy about like it, it no. Cause you, I think you were using all the bandwidth. Though. I think I probably was, yeah. Very I, I should have asked someone. We, we did mention <laughs> earlier on that, that Tony was a singer. Would you like to hear Tony singing? Oh. Because he had yeah. a kind of a hit. We've got something in, in the UK called Northern Soul. And... Tony was surprisingly a big success under the name of Lenny Gamble, weren't you? Yes, yeah. And, and here's the song. I think that's enough. Yeah, that's enough for that one. <coughs> can, I, can I explain? <laughs> can I explain? I did, uh, I've actually made 28 singles and mm. about three albums. Uh, that one there, it was I Love Soul Music, and that was originally done by a woman called Doris Troy, and I loved the song, and we had to have one more track to fill up the album, and I thought I could sing soul music. Yeah, and I I proved there I couldn't, <laughs> and, but it came out under a white label. Somebody um, put it out under the name of Lenny Gamble, and it became a, a great Northern Soul hit. But I think I'm right in saying Northern Soul, <coughs> in a strange sort of way, is music that is not is some of the Motown music that they didn't want to release because it was yeah. too bad, wasn't it? But that one was that wasn't one of my best ones. That. Well, you became a household name on the radio, but mm. you became also very well recognized through TV. Yeah. And one mm. of the biggest TV shows that we had in the UK for about 30 years was called Top of the Pops. Mm. That was a lovely jacket. That jacket. <laughs> I like your medallion as well. Yeah, I used to make. Yeah, I have quite a lot of that stuff. Yeah, <laughs> but it's um, the jacket. Yeah, it was. A, it was in the sixties, obviously. And it was from Carnaby Street, where all the fashion was, and uh, some of the yeah, some of the styles are ridiculous now. Yeah. Now, now um, like most big names, you go through peaks and troughs in your yeah. career, mm. and uh, I think it's only honest of us to say that. Another TV show actually brought you back to prominence in the UK, which was I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out, get of, me out here. of Here. Yes. I don't, do you get that show over here? Where they send celebrities into the jungle and they have to do tasks? Well, you don't, you don't have that. Tony oh. was the first king of the jungle. <laughs> That did open some new doors for you, though, didn't it? It did, yeah. Um, my my uh, agent at the time rang me up and said, uh, would I like to be dropped into the middle of the jungle in Australia and survive for two weeks? And I, for a TV show, and I said, I'd love to. And it was the, um, I'd love to do that. I thought he was joking. <laughs> and about two weeks later, ITV rang me up and said, uh, and interviewed me, and I'm a vegetarian and, uh, you know, I don't kill things. And uh, I was 60 then, because I'm 71 now. Um, and this was the very first time, and uh, they said to me, you know, would you like, you know, why are you here? Uh, they said, well, you wanted to see me. And I said, um, they said, you, would you kill anything? I said, no, I wouldn't do that. Um, and they said, what would you eat? And I said, well, I don't know, really. Hadn't thought about it. And I thought, well, that's it. And about three weeks later, I got the call, and that we were all dropped in the middle of this uh, jungle, and we survived. And um, I thought I'd just last for about five, six days or something, but I ended up winning the thing. Yeah. yeah. And, as I say, it did open some doors It did, for you. yeah. And yeah. it brought you back 
to prominence. Yes, yeah. The general public in the UK really embraced you. Mm. And uh, I think what it showed was that Tony has genuine warmth. And that's something that you can't give any radio presenter. You've, they've either got it or they haven't got it. And Tony has genuine, honest warmth. And the general public love him. He's been at the top of his game for 50 years. And let's hope we're doing this again in 10 years from now for your 60th anniversary. How about 50 anniversary. years from now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a bit ambitious for bit both ambitious, of us. Yeah. <laughs> 50 years on. Congratulations, Tony Blackburn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you.